really, as we are making these uh, drugs more available with legalization, we're changing the norms. We're changing the norms. We're going to actually, go just by probability, as Kevin was saying, going to see more of people taking drugs. And the brain, of course, is developing, and that's when it's most sensitive to harmful effects. Now, I'm, I'm speaking to the converted, so what I actually, obviously, I'm not trying in any way to convince you where what is. We all know that marijuana is not good, and I always sort of say, do we want uh, our young people to be stoned? Do we want a nation of stone young, stone young people, which are the ones that are going to really bring forward um, the next discoveries, the next governments? Do we want that? And, uh, and obviously the answer is an unequivocal no. But somehow we are missing uh, what it really means to have the legalization of marijuana come through in, in this country. And I, I, I mean, I actually been surprised because I get asked that question by very, very smart people, including my sister who lives in Mexico. And she says, Nora, for the level of crime that we have with drugs is incredible. We should just legalize. And I, and I always say, you know, this, this notion of legalization as a solution is a solution brought out of despair. That, that you don't know what else to do, but it's actually the wrong, like the, wrong, the very wrong decision. So what is it? And I think that uh, this is from the same survey that Kevin was showing you, the monitoring the future, that I'm using to, uh, we've been sampling kids since 1979 to actually look upon uh, the patterns of drug use. And I'm showing you this one here, just to illustrate the magnitude of the problem that we have currently already with marijuana in the United States. And it's, it's worrisome because what we're seeing is that we're seeing increases in marijuana the, over the past uh, seven, eight years. Uh, and in the meantime, we're seeing decreases in cigarettes. But for three years in consecutive, the rates of marijuana smoking are higher among top graders than those of nicotine smoking. And whatever you want to call it, left or right, I'm not advocating at all for tobacco because it is devastating at many levels. But one of the things that um, nicotine does not do when the person is smoking cigarette, it does not make them dumb. Marijuana does. And so when you're a 12th grader and you're trying to study, um, the consequences of not being able to memorize and learn are not going to be trivial. And of course, that's not the case for cigarettes. So we need to recognize that uh, these numbers are telling us something very fundamental about what's happening. Now think about it also. The other thing, this is an indicator of past, uh, this is past month use of marijuana versus cigarettes. But there's another indicator that actually even worries me more out of monitoring the future, which is regular use of marijuana among 12th graders. Now these are kids at school. And it's at its highest it's ever been. And it's 6.5% of 12th graders are smoking marijuana. That number is extremely high considering that one of the consequences of regular marijuana use is dropout. So indicating that the pattern of regular use of those age range is likely to be high. And it is at that range that we're likely to have the most adverse effects. So we have a serious problem vis-a-vis -vis the prevalence rates of marijuana. And vis-a-vis -vis the attention that has been garnered initially by the medicalization of marijuana and subsequently by the notion of legalization, uh, a negative impact in terms of attitudes, considering marijuana less harmful, and at the same time seeing more people taking it. And that's actually quite predictable. There's been a massive amount of knowledge regarding the effects of cannabinoid in our brains and in our body. Cannabinoids are extraordinarily important in regulating a wide variety of functions. And our, our body produces endogenous cannabinoids that activate exactly the same receptors as marijuana. Now, the main <coughs> active um, ingredient of marijuana is delta-9 tetrahydrocannabinoid, or 9-THC. This is actually very potent. It's, um, it's very rewarding reinforcing. However, when you, you, met, you smoke marijuana, you don't only ingest uh, THC, you actually ingest a wide variety of cannabinoids. So when we're addressing the issue of medical marijuana, or when we're addressing the issue of adverse consequences with marijuana, it has been very difficult to get a hold of, because two things have been changing. Number one is the quantity of 9 delta tetrahydrocannabinoid has gone from 2% 20 years ago to, in some places, 20%. And this is the psychoactive ingredient. And this increase in the active ingredient uh, in marijuana is likely to be responsible for very abrupt increases in people ending up in the emergency room 
uh, because of adverse consequences of marijuana. It's much more active. But the other thing that makes it complicated is that the content of these cannabinoids varies significantly. I'm particularly interested in this cannabidiol because cannabidiol in some ways antagonizes the effects of nine, nine, nine delta 9 THC. So when you have cigarettes that are very high in cannabidiol, you actually interfere with the high that you get with marijuana and you also interfere with the memory impairment effects of marijuana smoking. The problem is that marijuana cigarettes that have high content of cannabidiol don't have a high market value because they don't make you very high. But nonetheless, there's differences in the content and that in turn, in, in when you are doing studies and trying to investigate whether there are adverse effects or not, your findings are going to be very much dependent on the ultimately what type of marijuana that individuals are smoking. And I, and I, I will put forward that these uh, two, uh, two variables contributing are accounting for the diversity of findings that we have had in the literature for so many years. Now, the, the, that one element. What do we know then about these endogenous cannabinoids? They actually are located throughout the whole brain, and they are modulating in the releasing uh, other neurotransmitters. So cannabinoids can determine whether they're going to increase or decrease the release of neurotransmitters, a wide variety of them. And so they, they have multiplicity of effects. And there are two different types of receptors, cannabinoid uh, CB1 and CB2 receptors, and they have opposite actions in the brain. This is uh, actually an image from a human brain um, identifying the concentration of cannabinoid receptors in the brain. So this is images that you are getting from the uh, upper part of the brain, uh, horizontal slices to the lower parts. And the colors here represent the density of cannabinoid receptors. And you see that they are basically all throughout the human brain. And indeed, cannabinoid receptors are one of the most ubiquitous. Uh, they, with the highest levels of any one receptor relates to these cannabinoid receptors. Just to get you an idea of uh, what cannabinoids are, are, why they are important. If you look at it, for example, in the prefrontal cortex, this is likely to get involved with the involvement of cannabinoids in regulating cognitive function. In the hippocampus, uh, they are likely to be involved in memory. They're also very much involved in mood. And very importantly, they're also involved in motor coordination. So as of now, it's very difficult to come across almost a function for which cannabinoids do not exert some regulatory role. But very relevant to what we're trying to make people aware of is that the cannabinoids play a fundamental role in the development of the human brain, the architecture of the human brain. So their role as our brain is developing from fetal development to chapel to adolescence to adulthood. And your brain is changing a lot, enormously. Those changes are driven in part by cannabinoid receptors. And so the question that we have to put ourselves, and that's why I say I think that we need to focus in young people. What are the consequences of start, starting to disturb such a well-orchestrated process that it has evolved over years and years of evolution to have a complex brain as ours? What happens we all of a sudden flow those cannabinoid receptors when they are actually, those systems are driving the organization of the human brain? Now, the first question, I mean, and people say, well, is it harmful? Well, is it addictive? I mean, and I'm going to sort of say that is uh, an unequivocal yes, because that's another one of the arguments that people say, no, it's not addictive. Well, if you compare across different types of drugs, it is true that some of the drugs are more addictive than others. And this represents the percentage, in average, of people that when they get exposed to the drug are going to become addicted. And in the case of cannabinoids, it's approximately 10%. And so we use that number in general for any particular type of drug. Any individual exposed to a drug, approximately 10% will become addicted. Certainly some, some like cocaine and heroin are more addictive. And in the case of um, tobacco, one of the fallacies here, and, and people say it's more addictive than other drugs, not in any normal mode. One of the factors why you have such a high percentage of people becoming addicted to tobacco is that it's very easy to get regular access to it. So your frequent exposure increases the likelihood that you become addicted because it is uh, ultimately a, a, a legal drug. But marijuana, 10% of those kids that are uh, exposed to marijuana will become addicted. So as our numbers are coming up, that explains why we're also seeing an increase in individuals becoming dependent to it. 
The other aspect that we need to address and very relevant to the developing brain is there is evidence from epidemiological studies and now we also from animal experiments that early exposure to marijuana or in animal experiments, cannabinoid, drives the reward system to um, the effects of other drugs of abuse. And this was actually seen in, uh, in, in epidemiological studies that compare the rates of actually the old rates, which is basically your risk of becoming addicted to a wide variety of drugs, um, the, whether it's abuse or dependence, now we don't have that, that distinction, by comparing those individuals that have started smoking marijuana before age 17 versus those that started after age 17. And what you see here is that increases in risk as a function of having started before age 17 when compared with those after age 17. And whether you use the diagnosis of use or abuse dependence, what you see is that early exposure to marijuana significantly increases the risk for abuse and dependence of a wide variety of drugs. And it is the concept that we bring forward when we say this is a gay drug. And biologically, of course, that, that what researchers are investigating is what is it that cannabinoids are doing to the developing brain that then makes it much more sensitive to, to the rewarding and abuse-depending effects of other drugs. And, and so as we make this drug more available, what you're going to start to see is not, we can predict, not just an increase in the dependence of uh, marijuana itself, but you will also start to see increases in dependence for other, uh, for other, for illicit substances. Now, independent of addiction, which is of course a very negative thing for your brain, the question that I always get asked is does marijuana use negatively affect the brain? And there's a massive amount of studies, but it is very difficult to bite on them because some studies show, yes, it significantly impairs certain, certain functions. And I, what I can say consistently, if you are intoxicated, your cognitive performance goes way down. You are dumb, dumb. You become dumb, dumb. <laughs> the question is that the, the issue is is that long lasting? And so what, that is where a lot of the work has gone and the arguments has gone. Well, it's not so bad if you are dumber for one night. Well, my, my point again is if you're dumber for one night when you're supposed to be stalling, it's not so trivial. But is it possible that people that take marijuana regularly, are they going to become dumber for a long period of time when they are not taking the drug? Or, are, or could marijuana be doing other things? And that is where it has been harder to answer unequivocally because the studies have not used the technologies that are sensitive enough on the one way or that have had the controls to allow you to unequivocally say, yes, it's harmful. So whenever people have come to me and said, Nora, why don't you come up and say there is evidence that marijuana is harmful? I've been very reticent, I say it's not good for you, but to, to say unequivocally it calms your brain uh, long term because I think that coming up with a statement where you don't have solid evidence puts you in a very weakened position. But, but this is starting to change and now there are some very solid findings that are going to be very difficult to counter attack vis-a-vis the experimental design.